differences that anything we've been looking at recently? For the lab, we chose a partner. I can't assume we're doing the lab with a partner, or do we have to work with the uh, Good question. If you fill out the introductory survey and you said, I would like to work with this person, you are working with that person unless you hear otherwise from me. Okay. And those of you who have to be matched with someone, you should have gotten an email from me about that. Other questions? So one thing I'll say about Lab Zero, those three questions, uh, it is okay to be unsure about the absolute correct answer. What I'm more interested in, uh, if you're unsure, is describing what you did to investigate that question. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's due 9 p.m. tonight. I'll let me know if you would like to use a late day. So I'd like to start out with a bit of review from last time. First question, what is a file descriptor? This is specific to the Unix-based system. File descriptor is a concept from Unix. Uh, so take a moment and think about what. What is it that we mean by file descriptor? See what we're thinking. All right. Most of us are thinking B. Uh, please have a quick discussion with your neighbors about uh, what role file descriptors play and, and how that matches up with your DNC checkers. all right if you have changed your mind it's time to select a new choice all right so moving toward B that's great our file descriptor is going to be per process uh, entity and it's just going to be an index into our array of open files. This array each entry is likely to be a pointer to a structure this answer C, the data structure that keeps track of information about the file, things like its actual location on disk, and as well when we talk about file systems in more detail for the end of the course, we'll talk about inodes and the kind of terminology, but file structure is going to have some information about where this is on disk, how to get the actual data. It's going to keep track of where you have read to in the file, because every time you read from a file, you can continue reading from where you left off and probably other information as well. One thing I didn't mention, so the, the file descriptors are these uh, indices and also in Unix-based systems and for uh, the lab that's out today, 
spot one will always be reserved for standard input. That is a file that corresponds to reading input from the terminal or the console. And file descriptor one will a process always starts out having that as standard output, a file structure representing writing information to the to the console or the terminal. And so in Unix and also in OSV, all processes should begin their life with two open files for standard in and, and standard out. Any questions on that? Yeah, Jim. I'm wondering if somehow when you open a file, you can open the file from another file. So you're saying if process A opens a file, can process B also open that file? No, but so sometimes you're blocked from that because they are doing something to the file. Right? But, and then like, does, the, does the system have a way to track the files across process? So you could design file systems in different ways. Uh, in Unix and OSV, two processes can open the same file and read and write from that file. Now, what one process is doing may or may not be visible to the other process based on when the data is actually written to the disk versus just buffered in memory. Uh, and the file system will need to have some way to prevent two simultaneous writes from, say, corrupting the file or otherwise causing problems with these internal data structures. So there is some issue of concurrency. But uh, it is, in fact, critical that two processes be able to open the same file. For example, we want multiple processes to be able to print things to the terminal at the same time. And so they both need to have that file open, for example. Other questions? All right, one more of these. How does the operating system switch from running, running one process to running another one? Give me your best guess on this one. All right. Maybe C or D if you vote for A. Please discuss with your neighbors uh, how uh, how this is going to work. They've never melted down all of the farm tools in the country. They can't. All right. Let's do round two. <laughs> Lots of movement towards C. That's great because the current process pointer is something I just made up. Yeah. Very <laughs> official, but totally fake. Not a thing. <laughs> 
Um, so each process has a context that is the information the system needs to run that process. And when we switch to another, we save the context from the current process and load the context from this another. And that is why this switching from one process to another is called a context switch. Okay. So is the context just the register values, or is there other information that gets saved? That's a great question. Are the registers all that we need? Uh, almost certainly not. Uh, each process has its own uh, address space. That is its own kind of uh, set of virtual addresses that get translated to a physical address. And each process kind of gets its own isolated view of memory. And so to switch from one process to another, we need to switch over registers, but we also would need to switch which address space, kind of which uh, we need to switch how we're translating virtual addresses to physical addresses so that we start translating the addresses to those for the new process we're running rather than the old process. So, so. Is C, but D also looks very convincing. Is there not a, any pointer that's pointing to what the current process is? So there's likely some data structure that is keeping track of currently uh, alive or zombified processes. Um, and uh, there's certainly some thread that is currently running on each CPU. Uh, but there's not necessarily a piece of data that says right. that this is the address of the data for the currently running. And in particular, there's nothing that would get capitalized as current right, process right. pointer. That is definitely a big thing. Other questions? All right. So let's move on to today's topic. So we have this problem. If all we want to do, and this was true in the early days of computing, if all we want to do is have a single application, like we want to build a computer specifically to do a particular task and nothing else, then we almost don't need an operating system or The application can just be part of the operating system. That we're building the system, the same people that are implementing the operating system are also implementing this one application that we want to run. We trust that code as much as we trust the operating system code. And so they, it can all just be one program. And there's not this distinction between application and operating system. This is a concept that still has use today. And actually, one of our last topics in the course we'll be talking about uh, the idea of a unikernel, which is kind of in the age of web services getting back to this idea. But if once we move to many applications, and in particular applications implemented by some third party. We don't necessarily even know who they are. We certainly don't trust them. At that point, we need to be able to to be able to run code that we don't trust. We need to be able to do this safely, first and foremost, and we'd also like to be able to do it efficiently. 
this is the, the, the motivation. We have applications. We can't trust them, but we need to run that code. So this is where we get the idea of an operating system kernel. That is the part of the operating system that is responsible for making uh, potentially harmful things happen. So before we've seen a picture where we have multiple applications. I drew underneath that a box which I labeled operating system. But it's more accurately labeled this chunk of code, the operating system kernel. This part of the operating system that is the first code that runs on the system and that we trust to do to be able to do anything uh, the system needs to do. Trusted, untrusted, and below this is our hardware. So when an application, say, wants to do something with the hardware, wants to read a file, uh, write to a file, something like that, it needs to ask the operating system kernel, please do this thing with the hardware, turn control over to the kernel so that the kernel can then interact with the hardware, perform the task, return to the kernel, and then the kernel turns control back over to the application. And this process, the application turns over control to the kernel to do some tasks, kernel does it, and then returns control back to the application. This is referred to as a system call or a trap. So an application traps into the kernel in order to have the kernel perform some task. And Wednesday, we'll talk all about in more detail how traps work and how another important mechanism called an interrupt works. But for now, we have this kernel. We can ask it to do things by kind of turning over control. The this sort of model is not exclusive to like Linux or Windows or Mac, these, these operating systems. It shows up in, in web browsers. For example, if you load a web page, you don't want the JavaScript running on the web page to be able to do whatever it wants with your computer. You don't want the JavaScript to just be able to read the contents of your hard drive, for example. A normal program running on your computer could just read files on, on the hard drive. But we don't want a web page just to be able to do it without any permission. So you can think of application could be a web page. The kernel is actually the Chrome browser. And if a web page, JavaScript on a web page wants to do something that's restricted, it has to ask this sort of intermediate layer, which could be the browser. For this class, we'll focus on the operating system. But this is a, a fairly broadly applicable concept. Questions on it? Okay. Oh, are there any uh, trusted part of the OS beside the kernel? Or say the kernels are basically rep um, representing the operating system right now, right? Just a yeah, so it's a good question. Are there other parts of the operating system that are outside the kernel? Uh, in modern operating systems, absolutely. So one example would be uh, the code, uh, the part of the operating system that is the, the windowing system, that you can like have windows open and drag them around and kind of interact with some graphical interface. That's likely not part of the kernel. It's some uh, doesn't mean that we don't trust it, but its functionality doesn't need to be part of this core layer. And so typically you wouldn't 
included is part of the crime. Oh. So if we ignore security concerns, and I have an app that needs to do like a whole bunch of operations and system calls and stuff, would there be like a benefit to not having an OS at all? Like try and write an app that just directly interfaces with the hardware? Yes, so is there a cost to this design? For sure. Like an app having to go through the kernel to access the hardware, hardware definitely introduces some, some overhead. So if we're in some situation where um, perform where where this overhead is just unacceptable, then we need to move to some situation that's like this first one, where we have just kind of one trusted application and we can afford to give it direct access to the hardware. Uh, how this tends to happen in practice is through virtual machines. So if we, uh, but of course that introduces other. Uh, we have a basically a virtual machine in between the app uh, and the hardware uh, that is more like giving that app direct access to the hardware. And it's an active area of research to try and do that with the minimum possible overhead. Other questions? Here. This is the second pizza shirt you've had on. <laughs> the third pizza shirt. Third <laughs> pizza shirt, even. What is pizza? <laughs> Uh, this is Pizza John, uh, named after uh, John Green, YouTuber and author. And uh, many years ago, uh, this was some sort of inside joke on their YouTube channel. And now every year they celebrate Pizzamas. For two weeks, you can buy things with this design on them. And I have. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, there's, there's not really any more to it than that. <laughs> All right. So, how do we actually make this happen? Uh, the solution here is something called Dual mode execution, or also the OSEP textbook calls it limited direct execution. And we can think of kind of a, a initial uh, approach to saying this is uh, basically saying we want. We want there to be a kernel mode where you have unrestricted uh, execution. And a user mode that is restricted in some way. And so one way that we might implement these sort of two modes is just is that the OS just simulates all user instructions. Anytime an application tries to execute some CPU instruction, the OS first tries it to see, is this doing something that's allowed? If it's allowed, it then actually goes and executes the instruction. If not, it takes appropriate action. Hey, does simulating, like, simulating if it's allowed to do it include, like, checking if it's going to there's going to be any overlap with memory with other applications. Uh, so that would be a, a design detail. Uh, does this simulation check the memory accesses or just whether this kind of instruction you are allowed to execute? Uh, and then if there's a memory error that's caught at some different point when the instruction is actually executed, 
information. So, uh, but this sort of this approach is how something like JavaScript and other interpreted languages work. You're simulating the the like language runtime, simulating the operations, and if they're okay, then they're actually executed. Right for you. Then how does it decide what is acceptable and what is not acceptable? Uh, great question. How do we know what's allowed in this restricted mode? Uh, the answer is that we have a set of particular instructions, particular operations, which are considered privileged, and which uh, only, uh, in which for those to be executed, those to be executed, the CPU needs to be in some sort of privileged mode. So this is how we're going to make this more efficient. Instead of simulating the instructions at the software level, our better sort of, because this would achieve our kind of safety goal, but not so much the doing this efficiently goal, because they're kind of Every instruction is being simulated in, in software that's likely to be a high overhead, so better. We're going to do it in hardware. So we could have this list of privileged instructions kind of at the software level to, that we're checking is this allowed, but actually we're just going to be able to put our CPU in a privileged mode or not. And certain instructions will only be allowed when it is in the privilege mode. Yep. Can entire apps be like privileged, or is it like something that is small, like smaller than at, like app execution? Uh, so this is this is an interesting question. Uh, should an app be allowed to change the privilege level of the CPU? Seeing some folks shaking their head, why not? Well, you're old. Yeah. Because, well, like an app could just put itself in privilege mode and do whatever it wants. Be like, I'm going to go erase your disk. Exactly. We, we can't allow our untrusted code to change the privilege level of the CPU. So, it's only going to be the kernel that is allowed to make this change. So the instruction that changes the privilege level will be the privilege instruction. Yeah. But the app can like make a request to change the privilege level, right? So the app relies on whatever interface the operating system kernel provides to it. So the operating system kernel likely does not provide a system call that is like, change my privilege level. <laughs> but whenever the app goes into the kernel, that before the kernel can go do stuff with the hardware, it, that privilege level change needs to take place. And so that's going to be part of this kind of trap procedure that we'll go into detail in next time. Yeah. So are there parts of like, untrusted apps where if they go into the kernel, their privilege level will be turned up because the kernel is like, yeah, this is a cool thing you can do. Uh, yeah, so in terms of this privilege level, don't think of it as something that is associated with a particular app or not. It's something that as we look kind of across time, as uh, stuff is happening on the OS, sometimes the privilege level will be elevated and sometimes not. And so we kind of elevate it as needed when 
as if when the kernel needs to go do something uh, uh, that, that requires it. Yeah. So like uh, when the process from the app coming into like by default, which is all like uh, the bridge inception, and then the OS is just like assigned according correspondingly to like those set of instructions from the app, or they only come in with like what's like the default status of the instruction, the bridge status. Uh, I see. So are you asking like where this set of privileged instructions is determined? Yes, yeah, coming from the app like before getting to the kernel. So, which instructions are privileged uh, and, or, or not has to be determined by the hardware. Because the CPU is uh, the point of the system. If we're doing this in hardware, it's the CPU that when you ask it to execute a particular instruction, it is checking does this instruction require a privileged mode? And if so, am I in a privileged mode? So, when we execute an instruction in hardware, we are going to check the privilege of both the instruction and the current mode. And then from that, we're either going to execute it, if everything is, is hunky-dory, or generate a processor exception that is uh, uh, indicating that some invalid instruction has been executed. And typically, this will be handled by the kernel, and the kernel will uh, terminate that, that process with extreme prejudice. Right. I know you've explained this a lot, but could, <laughs> but I still don't completely understand. Uh, if you could you walk through the process of what would happen if a app that was you know good you know not some malicious app did need to do something that required uh, elevated privileges? Yeah, so uh, we'll go into the the nitty gritty technical details on Wednesday, um, but the high level is. If the app tries to just do something, execute one of these instructions uh, itself, it's going to right. cause an exception and die. It will make one of these system calls, which will kind of go through this process to turn control over to the kernel and elevate the privilege level. Wait, so how, how does the kernel know if it should elevate the privilege level or not? So the, the, so the, the kernel, whenever we go into the kernel with one of these system calls, it will elevate the privilege level so that it's able to do what is, um, what is asked but then, by the system call. But, if, but didn't we just say that the system call can't necessarily do stuff that, like if it's malicious, then it, it, so how is it secure? So the, the system call is a specific interface. So for example, yeah, let's say the application wants to open a file. Yeah. So as part of that system call, it will check, does this application have permission to open that file? So like all of these gotcha. system calls, the ones that, and the ones that you will implement. So that specifically is happening in software though then, right? Yeah, so there there are yeah, I guess there are two things going on. There are, there are uh, the question of the instructions that do stuff with the hardware, those are privileged. Right. User code can't execute those. And then there's also for the semantics of whatever particular operation we're trying to do, such as open a file, there might be things like if you're not the owner of the file, if you don't have permission to read it, then you're not allowed to open it. And that's, yes, that's logic in gotcha. yeah. how the, the file system is implemented. Sebastian? So you're talking about how um, when the app needs to make, like, a do some privileged instruction, it has to go through the kernel first. Mm -hmm. But does that mean that apps can make certain instructions to hardware without going through the kernel that aren't privileged? Uh, 
Yes, yeah, so uh, there are a lot of instructions that that are in the, the data, the, sorry, the code part of memory for the application. We're fetching them out of memory, and the CPU, the CPU, every time, under this model, every time it executes an instruction, it is checking, does the privilege level this instruction required match the current privilege level? And like adding two registers together, that doesn't require elevated privileges, so that can just be executed. The kernel does not need to be full. And sorry, those those checks are actually done in the hardware. You're saying there's like in the circuitry itself. It'll just if it tries to execute one of those privileged instructions and it's not in the right mode, it'll just like stop. So it will cause a processor exception, and it's up to the OS. Like this will invoke a function in the OS kernel to handle this kind of exception, and then the kernel will decide what to do. It's almost certainly still a process. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, in this on the CPU, there's a specific register that, main, that maintains the status of the CPU, which will include the privilege level. And when the CPU goes to, before it executes an instruction, each instruction, the, it's again part of the circuitry, what the privilege level of that instruction and it is checked against the pri privilege level of CPU's currently. Yep. Are the algorithms for doing that hardware simulation, is that like decided at like the architecture level or like the manufacturer level? Or? So this would be decided at the uh, CPU architecture level. So it would be Intel, for example, and in fact, it was Intel that decided x86 has the specific E flags register that maintains this information about what the privilege level of the process is. Um, and then operating systems are then designed kind of with the details of a particular architecture uh, in mind. Um, one interesting wrinkle is that from Intel's perspective, they want to go out and find new applications that require new hardware features so that then they can implement those so then you have to buy their new processors. So this sort of protection like didn't always exist and this was something that, that was kind of created as people realized we needed computers to have this sort of user and, and kernel separation. All right. So, we've talked about what a process, uh, what if a process wants to do something restricted, uh, it gets the kernel to do it, or it tries to do it itself, and it dies. So, here's another uh, important question. It relates to how the OS is kind of managing processes. So what if our operating system wants to stop running some process A and start running some process B? We talked about how this is a, a context switch, kind of what the operating system needs to do. But we, in this model, in order for the kernel to do something, the application is asking it to do something. And in this scenario, process A is not asking the operating system to stop it. The operating system wants to stop process A and give process B a turn. So, for example, maybe process A is in an infinite loop, and it's just never going to give the kernel control. So, I'd like you to take a couple minutes and brainstorm with your, your neighbors uh, how the operating system might confront 
this problem? Like, what does the, what might be, what thing might we need to add to our kind of conception of what an operating system can do in order to, to answer this question? well, if it's if it's you're asking the kernel to do something, like it has this trap, like this guy. I feel like the kernel is the god. It's just be like Yeah, yeah, nothing. Yeah, 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 if you could, then I guess that I guess that's all right. Uh, any <laughs> any thoughts, general? Would it implement the parent process, which constantly holds the new system signal? So, can you say a little bit more about? Yeah, like just um, some process which, like, with it very frequently checks. Okay, have you received like an interrupt signal or kill signal? Otherwise, continue ex executing the process. You mean like we have a process whose job it is is to sort of monitor what's going on in the system and determine if it's time to, to switch? Yeah, so I I like this idea. We like having uh, some part of the system that's sort of responsible for, for managing this makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, if this is a process, and process A is currently not letting anyone else, any other process run, this process is going to be also sort of waiting on process A. That's why I specified you as the parent process of process A. So uh, that's, that's fair. Our, we, we can set up process with, with parent-child relationships, but still might be the case that only one process is on the CPU at a time. So if the child process is on the CPU, the parent doesn't necessarily get a turn to run. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so maybe you just set a hard limit on how long you're allowing any process to run at any given time. So you're just like, process A will only ever run for 10 steps, like continuously, and then we'll check to make sure if there's anything else we have to do, like stop PA or switch to PB. Yeah, we have some sort of limit built into the actual hardware saying, all right, a process after it executes N instructions, then someone else gets a turn. And the, uh, and the hardware is, is helping us in, enforce this. So that moving this out of the, like including the hardware in this, uh, 
I think is a, a promising direction since software-wise, like process A is is preventing any any other code from from being able to run. Oh. So like a hard limit, you can do like a signal thing, like when the signal comes to CPU, it just says, okay, no, we'll stop the process and keep the OS kernel. Just have someone have like a signal that just like says switch time. There's some signal that uh, comes in and, and tells this system, okay, now it's time to, to switch. So some signal that uh, if the signal, like we can send a signal to process A saying, okay, now it's time to, to stop running. But if process A is in an infinite loop, it might you know, not respond to this signal. So uh, this this signal is going to need uh, like the signal would need a way to uh, change who is currently using the processor. Just to clarify, if one process is running, does that mean that nothing else can like occupy any other space in the CPU? Like in this example. So I am imagining a. A kind of uniprocessor, we just have one CPU, so only kind of one thread can be running on it at a time. So if process A's uh, is in this infinite loop, it is just kind of hogging all the CPU, the one CPU that we have. If we have multiple CPUs, this picture gets uh, a, a little more like uh, maybe we don't need to stop process A, we can run process B on some other CPU. But in this case, we just have. Yeah. Um, by saying the, the OS wants to stop PA, does it mean like on behalf of the user, or like the, the OS sometimes can say, "Oh, I want to stop PA." Uh, yeah, this is something that the OS ha uh, wants to do itself. Like its scheduling policy says, "All right, I want to stop running process A and start running process B." Uh, why doesn't the combination of those first two options work? Like, if you, if you just have one process that says, okay, you know, process, like, the, the pro one process is always running, and it just says, you know, process A can run for five instructions, and then process B can run for five instructions, and process A can run for five instructions, and process B can run for five instructions, you know, forever. Why doesn't that work? Uh, no, I think that actually could work. Uh, my, uh, I'm not trying to give the impression that, that none of these work. These are just... We're, we're discussing different approaches to this design. Um, so something that's kind of a, a, a combination of bullet points two and three here is something called a timer interrupt. So first it's important what is an interrupt. Does anyone uh, recall from certain 208 lecture what uh, what an interrupt is or what that means? Oh, it's just a signal that basically steals control from the CPU. Yes, it is an asynchronous. It's not generated by some instruction that process A executed. It's something that happens kind of outside of the current thread of execution, some external event interrupts the current flow of execution and transfers control to some function that handles that kind of interrupt. And more about the, the mechanics of this next time, but Importantly, this is going to transfer control to an interrupt handler. In this case, the function that is specifically for handling timer interrupts. And these handlers will be part of 
the current. Which means that when this timer interrupt happens, it forces control to switch from whatever this system is currently doing to this interrupt handler. And so long as this timer interrupt is generated by the hardware, as in it's not dependent on some process getting a turn on the CPU in order to generate the interrupt, there's just some clock built into the CPU that every 30 milliseconds or whatever the, the timer is, every, every, at every interval generates a timer interrupt and transfers control to this interrupt handler. And at that point, the OS kernel can continue, can, cannot do anything. It can just continue, go back to doing what it was doing before, or at that point it can make the decision to switch from a different process. Hey. Does the kernel itself ever get any interrupts? Uh, that is a, a, a great question. Can the kernel itself be interrupted? Uh, so absolutely external events that cause interrupts can happen while the kernel is doing things. So uh, here's a, a scenario to consider. We have this timer interrupt. It happens uh, every uh, three milliseconds. Our interrupt handler is doing something complicated that takes four milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So a timer interrupt occurs, we start executing the handler. Three milliseconds into our four millisecond handler, we get another timer interrupt that inter interrupts the handler. And we start trying to do the same thing again, it gets interrupted by the timer again. And you can see we never escape the timer interrupt. So it's very important as one of these privileged instructions that we be able to disable interrupts for some period of time. And so when this timer interrupt occurs and we start doing the interrupt handler, we first need to disable interrupts so that we can actually get through the interrupt handler without some other interrupt getting in the way. And then we have to make sure before the kernel transfers control back to the user to re-enable interrupts. Otherwise that's going to turn off this. If we leave them disabled, we'd never be able to turn off again. Yeah, well. If an application is doing something timing uh, sensitive, can it request do most operating systems provide a mechanism for an application to request disabling interrupts for like some amount of time? So that's, that's an interesting use case. Like uh, the application, some real-time system, it absolutely needs to get this done in the next uh, an amount of time. Uh, so if the operating system provided a way for user code to disable interrupts, uh, then we might be end up back in this situation where a process disables interrupts and then enters an infinite loop. Uh, so, if we provided such a mechanism, it would need to be very carefully designed to avoid this, this pitfall. I think generally user applications don't have a way to turn off, uh, turn off interrupts uh, uh, for this particular, particular reason. Uh, and you're more likely to rely on uh, like scheduling priority to say this process is really high priority, so it's going to get sort of preference for using the CPU. Um, and for very special purpose applications where uh, even the tiniest interruption is going to uh, be unacceptable, then you need to then you need to do some kind of providing us uh, a special kind of functionality that only this one type of process can use. You you have to kind of get creative with the, the design. Other questions? All right. I think it is time.
for John Tyler. Our tenth, tenth president. So John Tyler uh, took office one month after he was elected vice president uh, when William Henry Harrison died. And uh, like all the previous nine presidents, with the exception of John Adams and John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, uh, John Tyler was a, a slaveholder. And he was also pro-states' rights and uh, slavery at the time. Uh, and when the Civil War broke out, he joined the, the Confederacy and was elected to their uh, House of Representatives. And uh, as I hinted at last time, uh, he was not aligned politically with his political party. And so when he took uh, office after Harrison died, he went on to uh, veto several Whig Party legislative priorities. He was also kind of getting in the way of the presidential ambitions of some prominent Whig politicians. It was another element to it. He was the first president to have a veto overridden by the legislature. Uh, but he had a kind of modern conception that the president should set the kind of legislative agenda or the political agenda for the country, uh, whereas people at that time believe it was Congress that should do that. And and sort of today's political system, it's very much the president who is viewed as setting the, the agenda and Congress sort of follows along. Uh, so John Tyler, not a, uh, kind of had a, a stalemate uh, in, uh, uh, domestic agenda in fighting in the, in the political party uh, did conclude a couple of important treaties with Britain, uh, uh, working out some uh, uh, border issues. So this was the United States at the time, and there was uh, kind of questions about where the the border of the U.S. would be in the Northwest. Uh, John Tyler also really wanted the U.S. to annex Texas and uh, signed a bill to, to do this right before, uh, right before he left office. This is at the time where uh, Texas was uh, trying to break away from Mexico. Largely a kind of forgotten president today, uh, partially for, for good reason, not, uh, uh, not that consequential. All right. That was our presidential facts. All right, so the remaining time, I want to make sure that I talk about uh, lab one, the lab that, that's out today. So uh, in lab one, let's all put this back on, this back over. All right, so your task for lab one is going to be implementing a set of system calls uh, for the file system. So in particular, you'll be implementing the system call to open a file, close a file, read from a file, uh, uh, and a couple others. Now, the actual file system in OSV has already been implemented. So your task is essentially to implement the part of the kernel that is uh, treating the data passed in by the user as if you were like, as if it's toxic waste, like full hazmat suit, pliers carefully pulling out the, the argument and, and making sure it's okay. And then if everything looks good, passing those arguments on to the actual underlying file system call. So as an example, we can look at the system call to remove a directory. So 
this uh, uh, remove directory, kind of from the user's perspective, it takes in a string that is the, the path to the directory to be removed. And so what this system call does is it needs to kind of fetch that argument um, uh, from, uh, and, and how the argument is fetched is actually um, uh, architecture dependent. So if you remember from uh, x86 assembly, arguments passed into a function are stored in particular registers. And so the first register, or the first argument should be in the register RDI. And so if I want to see how does fetch argument work, this is a, a useful tool for, for kind of navigating uh, this repo in general. If I right click on the function and go to go to definition or hit F12, it will take me to the definition of that function, which is actually in the arch x86 kernel syscall.c in the kind of architecture dependent part of the code. And we see that if it's fetching the first argument, it is accessing something called a trap frame, which we'll look at in more detail uh, next time. But it's getting a, it's basically the, R, the contents of the RDI register have been saved in this structure. It gets those to fetch the first argument. It then makes sure that fetch argument uh, returned true. And otherwise, uh, it will panic. So a, when, a, uh, when a problem occurs in the kernel, there's, like, there's nowhere else in the system to turn to, to to handle some problem that happened in the kernel. The only appropriate response is panic. <laughs> and so there is just a function, panic, which will halt the kernel and display a message. And so if you're running in Kimu, you'll see something like panic, colon, and then the message that was passed to the panic function. But when the problem occurs in the kernel, you just have to give up. <laughs> uh, which is why it's very helpful that we are uh, running OSV in this sort of Kimu emulator. Because if you were booting it on an actual computer, it tries to boot up, it panics, there's literally nothing you can do other than restart the computer. Uh, well, first edit the kernel and then try and boot it again and see if it works. So once we fetched the argument and made sure that was a success, call this validate string function, which is defined in this file, and checks that this array of characters is all in valid memory location. And then once all that is done, it just passes this on to this fs remove directory, the actual file system function that will actually go and remove the directory. And whatever the return value of that is, we just want to send that on back to the user who made the system call, so we're just returning that. And this is the basic uh, pattern of, of what you'll be doing for this lab. Uh, the other, kind of the main other thing is that something that this, uh, that OSV doesn't currently have is uh, file descriptors or that array of open files. Processes don't currently keep track of that in OSV. And we can see in the call to read from a file, currently it's hard coded that if the file descriptor is zero, call this console read function. <laughs> We want to get rid of that and replace it with calling the fs read file function and have our console standard in and standard out represented by actual files. So one of the first things that you want to do is to go to proc.h, which is where our struct maintaining oops, Maintaining information about each process is defined, and you want to add to this struct your array of pointers. And fs.h 
is the uh, header file that gives the definitions for all of our file system functions that you'll be uh, that you'll be using. Open file, reopen file, close. There is also a at the top of this file. There is a file struct, which, uh, as I was mentioned earlier, includes a, a reference to this inode data structure that keeps track of what is actually on the disk, as well as keeping track of a, a position and, and some other things. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is that the operating system will keep track of how many times each file has been opened. So that it knows when it can, when it no longer needs to keep information about that file in memory, if no process currently has it open anymore. And so there's this idea of a, a, a reference count, kind of how many times has this file been open? Every time it's closed, every time it's open, we add one. Every time it's closed, we subtract one. When it's zero, we can throw it away. Uh, so the uh, the lab. Uh, the disk you says remember to call fs reopen file at certain points in order to appropriately increment this this reference count. Uh, I think the other thing I want to mention about the lab is uh, there's kind of instructions uh, about setting up git. Uh, GitHub both for uh, working with a partner as well as it's a convenient way to actually submit the code uh, to Gradescope. And so there's step-by-step -step instructions here. Uh, I will emphasize it should be a private GitHub. It will be considered an academic integrity violation to have your uh, OSB code public. Um, But one of the, the things about this lab uh, is that future labs you'll be expected to uh, create a design document for the lab and you'll be getting feedback from, uh, from other groups. Uh, but for this lab, I have provided a design document for you which is linked uh, from here that kind of talks about uh, the general approach and kind of different things you'll need to do when implementing the, the functions. And this is also something you can refer to uh, on future labs when you're, you're writing your own any questions about uh, the lab, anything that I've, I've mentioned? All right. Uh, well, I think two minutes is not enough to launch into a new topic, so I'll stop there. Uh, I have office hours, 4.30 to 5.30 and today and Wednesday morning. Uh, otherwise, see you in five Wednesday.